Hey class, so we're going to go through the debate today on what, how government should involve itself in healthcare. Uh, just a personal story. So uh, when I graduated college, I had uh, come down with uh, type 1 diabetes two years prior. And at the time, that means that I could not have a lapse in insurance coverage. And if I did, it would be very hard for me to get it back at exuberant rates. I'd be paying five, six hundred dollars a month, which, uh, even if you're fresh out of college with degrees, it's just not tenable. It's, it's a lot of money. So, uh, and then there's the other issue of family story. Uh, my sister, um, not really my sister, but she at one point lost her leg, and every five years she would have to save up thirty thousand dollars to get a new leg because insurance would not necessarily say that a new leg was medically necessary, even if one broke, uh, so there wasn't an availability to have a backup. Um, so you probably have stories like this in your family too, where medical costs are just through the roof. So today we're going to talk about the government's possible solution to some of these problems. So, I kind of gave the background uh, of some personal stories, but let's go before Obamacare, also known as the Affordable Care Act, before it, which was signed into law in 2010. This is probably the lesson I have to update the most, simply because the numbers change that much, and because the debate around it is one of the most contentious in the country. Obviously. Trump ran on the idea that the Affordable Care Act needed to be reversed. Republicans tried to um, dismantle the law numerous times, have yet to be unsuccessful, or have been unsuccessful. But let's get to the problems, especially before the law. In 2010, 38% of Americans were uninsured. Uh, that means that 40 million people um, did not have health insurance. That meant that they they were less likely to go to a doctor. They might have been less likely to get tests. Uh, the question is, you know, uh, obviously in those cases like my sister or myself, um, it prevented us from reaching out to our jobs, going out on our own. It was a huge problem. Even then, the insured, even if someone was insured, was often underinsured. So health insurance was very costly. So it wouldn't be anything for someone to get a $30,000 hospital bill and still have insurance. That creates problems. That creates bankruptcy. Uh, money problems are the number one cause of divorce as well. So, uh, and people were going bankrupt because of high medical costs. We were also spending 25% of our gross domestic product on healthcare. This was more than education and defense. Um, Health care costs were going up 13% a year. Uh, slowed, they have slowed to 6% a year, but they're still increasing. And you have to remember, this was during the time when inflation was 0 to 2%, especially 2008 to 2010. Health care is going up 13%, but we're in a recession at the time. Uh, wages are down. Uh, the cost of goods were down because people were trying to move them because they no one was buying anything. So why is health care going up, but everyone else is slowing down? And this was a long-term trend as well. There was also quite a bit of red tape. It was uh, There was quite a numerous ways for insurance companies to drop coverage and then leave someone footing the bill for you know, a $2,000 doctor visit, which would not be uncommon, uh, de depending on how long the doctor was with you, how many tests they did. Um, so there was numerous ways for the insurance companies to drop coverage and then thus, therefore, um, make it cheaper for them to uh, to exist in some ways and to either pay their employees higher rates or to insure only healthy people. Um, they would, There's a couple things they would do. So the first one is if you had a pre-existing condition. Uh, for, so for me, that would have been diabetes, for example. Uh, I could not buy insurance because that would be deemed as unhealthy. Or uh, I could buy healthy insurance, but it would be at a premium, and it wouldn't cover you know, my condition. Uh, this would go back so far back as maybe if someone had cancer 10 years prior, they would be dropped for cover. They wouldn't be allowed to get insurance. Even though they're perfectly healthy, they're out of remission, uh, but because they had a condition in the past, 
uh, there was a way for them, the insurance companies, not to grant coverage. Uh, and then you gotta remember, this is these are things, items that people don't control. Now, on the flip side, uh, insurance is they are companies they are in the business of making money, um, and the more sick people you have in a plan, the less likely you are going to be make money. So you have to balance. Some of this has to be balanced with business interests, of course, too, if you're a business. Uh, but we also learned that the insurance companies were getting so big that almost 33%, 33 cents a dollar were going to administrative costs or, bureau, or the bureaucracy. Uh, and there's, there's you know, some tangible reasons for that, but they were becoming behemoths. And so any way they could drop people would be advantageous to A, the bottom line, and B, the, the people that are healthy. Um People would drop, have coverage drops. So if someone came down with a pretty hefty illness, like leukemia, for example, it wasn't um, unheard of for an insurance company to just drop that person from covering them. Sometimes there was a, if you had a gap in coverage, so uh, especially for people with pre-existing conditions, if they left one job, maybe they got fired or maybe they got laid off. Just, you know, 2000, there was a recession, for example, and they didn't find a job within six months. An insurance company could deny them coverage at the new employer. Um, there was also lifetime maximum, so someone could only get so much money back from the insurance company. And again, if someone's really sick, uh, not only are they going to be saddled with debt and high medical costs, the insurance company might drop them when they need them the most. Um, <laughs> so... From a partisan perspective, what I mean by this is most Americans at the time in 2010, Republicans and Democrats, 80, uh, at the rate of 80% agreed that these items especially needed reform. So enter the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. It's this government to the rescue. The Affordable Care Act did a couple things. First off, it allowed... Uh, students or children to stay on their parents' insurance uh, from previously being at 18, unless they went to college, uh, to 26. And this would allow people to find jobs. And again, for those you know students or children that had pre-existing conditions, if they didn't get insurance at 18 um, because they went to college, they might not be able to get it again. There was also, <clears throat> there was also the idea that because there was 40 million uninsured Americans, the healthcare costs were going up because hospitals had to eat those costs. So if someone went into the hospital uh, and someone didn't have insurance, obviously that person would still be on the hook for paying it, but they might not because healthcare costs are extremely expensive. So that person might declare bankruptcy. Uh, and then in that case, the, health, the hospital wouldn't get paid. And sometimes even if they did have insurance, they might not be able to pay them back for six months or up to a year. That means the hospital has to eat that cost, right? They still have to pay their doctors and nurses. They still have to get medicine. They still have to provide cleaning supplies for to make sure everything's sterile. Uh, they're extremely expensive. One way to lower the uninsured and there, have therefore insurance companies pay the hospitals quicker and then they can stay in business and, and theoretically lower costs um, was to make sure that everyone had Healthcare, and this is probably the most controversial piece of the law. It is now uh, by law you have to have health insurance, um, either through your parents, through work, or you have to buy it. And many people thought, you know, well, you have to have car insurance to drive. Um, why don't you need health healthcare insurance? Uh, the issue is driving is pretty much a privilege. And it's not necessarily right. And healthcare is one of those things you just can't control. You can't control when you're going to get sick. Uh, you can't control when you're going to be healthy. So, um, but the idea by having this mandate would be to force people more to have insurance. And the Supreme Court agreed uh, and called it essentially that was a, a form of a tax. And the government has the power to tax, even though that's not what the law said. The other idea was to increase competition um, with the people that are uninsured. So when people are employed, uh, insurance companies can give the employees a lower rate than it would be for them to buy themselves because they're in a group. Uh, s similar to if you went to Costco or uh, Sam's Club, for example, and bought you know 
a big box of peanut butter crackers as opposed to a little box, you, you know, you end up paying less. Uh, so the idea was to group all the people that are uninsured into these exchanges. Um, so they would be kind of an employee base, so to speak, and they could buy insurance on their own. Um, so you could go to healthcare.gov, for example, and see what insurance companies are in these exchanges per your state. The states would also be responsible for um, setting up these exchanges. And there were some controversies with that too, uh, whether it's, you know, the state's responsibility at all. We don't really have time for this right now, but there is a question of, uh, was the federal government overextending itself? Um, the exchanges were, you know, you would sign up on a website, it's still really complicated, but when it was launched, uh, the website crashed numerous times. Uh, it eventually was up and running fairly smoothly. But many insurance companies now have left those exchanges. So there's only one or two insurance companies providing insurance in those exchanges, which leads to less choice and overall less or more money. Um, Pre-existing conditions, however, would now be forced to be covered. So someone like myself could get insurance at a somewhat reasonable rate. Um, to And they couldn't deny me coverage as well. So many people want in any discussion on healthcare reform, whether it's reforming this law or going to a single payer system where we have health insurance for everyone uh, um, built into our uh, kind of like social security in some ways, uh, pre-existing conditions is one thing that everyone wants along with the insurance for 18 to 26 year olds. Um, there was also a requirement for businesses to provide insurance of 50 for, for 50 people or more. Again, at the time, insurance was getting really expensive and many companies were just opting out of it. They weren't providing it anymore or they were providing a high deductible insurance plan, uh, which many have moved to now to save costs because uh, when you include more sick people in, in coverage, coverage is going to go up. Um, so... High deductible insurance plans means that someone ha might have to pay, you know, forty-five hundred dollars of the, the whatever medical costs they have for the year, uh, which for many families could be, um, you know, up to for the average American family, for example, would be around twenty percent uh, of their income for the year. Still, that twenty percent gross domestic product we went over. So, did the Insh Aff Affordable Care Act work well? There's a couple questions, and there's a New York Times article below that I want you to read or at least look at. Um, the question is, did it decrease the uh, amount of people that were insured in the, in the country? Yes. Uh, we went from 40 million uninsured to 15 million uninsured. Um, that's a pretty big drop. Now, obviously, that's due to the mandate, but if we look at the people that are less insured uh, or not insured anymore, we have way more people in the in the insurance banks that have insurance to back them up, especially if they come down with um, a life-threatening disease, and that's a good thing. Uh, Out-of-pocket expenses dropped to 1.3%, so Amer overall Americans are paying less on health care, um, but, you know, out of their pocket, and that means what insurance doesn't cover. Uh, but 1.3% for the most part is still uh, fairly marginal, and I'll show why that might not matter too much. So um, here's the other thing, though. If we look at did the Affordable Care Act make health care affordable, uh, the question, the answer is really no. Um, our health care GDP has increased to $3.2 trillion. We make about $15 trillion, so it's actually gone up a little bit. Uh, rates are still going up for healthcare on average at 9% per year. Um, so even though, you know, healthcare costs, out-of-pocket costs drop 1.2%, the, uh, the amount of money that people are paying into healthcare really has gone up. Uh, this is even more in some state health plans as they're going up 30 to 50% as health insurance companies leave those exchanges, like I said. Aetna was the latest, and this leads to increased costs and increased choice. Or decreased choice. So there's plenty of debates as well surrounding healthcare. First off, the idea is deficit spending. Um, we're not quite sure on how much the government is spending, but at the time um, it, was, it was increased to 26 billion, I believe. Uh, the question is, should the government be taking on more money? Do we, when we're running at, you know, um, we're spending millions and billions more than we have per year, is adding to that a good idea? You know, what 
promises is possessed long term. Well, theoretically, it's going to. You could look at California example, which has the highest tax rate and the most amount of poor people in the, in the area. Um, it's going to lead to less services and more taxes. The government's track record as well. Uh, do we want the government really managing healthcare in the first place? Uh, we I if you could point to numerous areas where government's incompetent. I know this is com these are completely do different topics, but if you look at the two uh, some of the two most recent mass shootings, both in San Antonio um, and Parkland High School in Florida, uh, there were people that were on lists that shouldn't have had guns. Um, we're going to get into guns later, so I'm not going to get into that, but it just I'm using that point to show that government mismanages things all the time. Uh, Medicare is well known for having a plethora of problems. There's numerous doctors out there who won't take Medicare payments because Medicare sets limits of how much they'll pay, and it's simply less than what the doctors need or they're charging for their service, so they don't take it. Um, so Medicare for senior citizens is woefully uh, under insured. They're woefully underinsured, and they paid into it their whole life. Do we want that for the rest of the country when they can't even manage the senior citizen population? Then there's the question of gov the government involvement and mandate. Do we want? Uh, should the government be forcing people to buy a product? Uh, people could say, well, you, like I said, they they force you to buy car insurance, but car insurance is different than health. Now, can they tax you? Yes, but that's not what the original language or debate was. There's also the debate that this is socialism, that the government is moving us towards uh, getting rid of all personal companies and all personal enterprise. Um, the question is, there's plenty of areas where we do have government provided services already. Uh, so CHIP, for example, insurance for people that were under 18. Uh, Medicare, people for insurance for people that were 67 and over. Uh, the economy is regulated numerous times. Uh, there are price floors on milk or cigarettes, for example, price ceiling, I'm sorry, price floors on, price floors on cigarettes, price ceilings on milk. You know, so there's only so much that the government, um, only so much that someone can get for those products. Um, what makes healthcare different, in other words? So we have numerous, quote unquote, socialistic programs where the government steps into the economy in some ways and regulates it. Is healthcare really all that different? And then there's the issue of religious freedom. Uh, some of the provisions of the healthcare law required uh, hospitals or religious organiza religious health organizations, which make up a large uh, part of the, the healthcare field, to provide medicine that they said would go against their conscience. So um, birth control, for example, uh, would have gone against many Catholic hospitals' uh, personal beliefs. Uh, and at one point, the government was saying, no, you got to buy them. There's a, there's a public incentive to do that. Uh, unfortunately for the government, the courts agreed with those institutions. So there's plenty of debate to go around. I have two videos here I would like you to watch. Uh, they're fairly short each, um, but you're going to need them for today's lesson. One is against Obamacare. The other is for Obamacare. This one's a little older, but um, it was released in 2015, so it's still, for the most part, pretty relevant. I also have uh, John Green from Crash Course. You might have seen him before. Just explain uh, what it was even five years ago. Um, and a couple other resources from the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative-based uh, think tank. And they provide some data on the Affordable Care Act and why moving towards a single-payer system would not be a good idea. And then the New York Times gives a good overview of where the Affordable Care Act has been successful and where it hasn't. So we're going to get into the, the question, should government be involved in the business of regulating health care?